Hello, my elegant warriors. I am so excited to introduce you to my guest and you may already know her because she's quite famous. Her name is Tara Stiles. In the introduction, I told you all about all of the things that she has done. She's written, I think, eight books with a ninth on the way. She um, is the found co-founder, I think, and she runs Strala Yoga. We are going to talk a little bit about what that is, but she is also a new friend and I adore her. Tara, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh my gosh. I'm just excited to spend time with you and hang out. So thank you so much. I know. I wish it was in person, but this is the yeah. next best thing. So I, there's so much I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about all the books you've written. I want to talk to you about Strala Yoga, but I wanted to mainly pick your brain about the way that you have found a way to be your own authority. Mm. It's something that I talk to my, I have a membership, the um, B Belief Builders Academy. And I often say, I can't tell you what to believe. I can't tell you what to think. You are your own authority. And when I look at your career and the choices you've made and the way that you live your life, it's really clear to me that you are your own authority. Do you feel that? Yeah, I feel, I, I would say that's a really descriptive way to put it. I've never been able to put how I feel about all of all of the things that I feel so compelled to be doing with my time. <laughs> but it does feel like that, you know, authoritative, almost like over me or through me, something like that for sure. Yeah. I mean, you make choices, you know, like your, one of your books is make your own rules diet. <laughs> and I feel like you live a make your own rules life. Definitely. Definitely. I feel like that was such a huge part of, you know, I want to say like when I first started leading yoga, but really it's, it's been evergreen and it's, that's kind of nice. I don't feel like I'm you know, ashamed of something I did like 10 or 20 years yeah. ago, yeah. but it still feels true because it's so easy to sort of listen to what everybody else is doing or how everybody else is doing yoga. And even those internal voices of, I should be doing it this way. I, I should look this way. I should have this kind of body because the people on my right and my left do instead of just listening to yourself. And I've always felt like making your own rules is really just you know, it, it's a, it's a cooler way to feel about noticing how you feel and sensitizing to what's going on with you and making just better choices about how you want to navigate your life. So did you, were you raised that way? No, <laughs> maybe though, <laughs> maybe, I mean, I'm from the Midwest, so small town where everybody is kind of the same. I mean, I think it was my dream to do something to get to New York and, you know, meet people that were look different, act different, had different backgrounds and all that stuff. But maybe looking back, my parents were their own rebels in a way. I mean, they, they both left their tiny town and my dad joined the Navy and they got to travel around a little bit. So that was a big deal for them. Mm -hmm. And they ended up building with not a lot of money, this little passive solar house in the woods. And my mom grew vegetables and they were kind of doing yoga things like they made us recycle on the weekends they were kind of like straight edge hippies at the time I was like you know you're not drink they didn't drink they didn't do drugs none of the fun stuff but they <laughs> were kind of they were doing these things without making a big deal about it so I think I had the freedom to discover myself without mm -hmm. the pressures of oh no you need to you know we didn't wear fancy clothes it was just like don't don't mess up your church clothes and these are your school clothes and these are your you know, hose down before you come inside. So the rules were very simple and logical. And I, I do think that just gave me the space to kind of figure out who I was. Yeah. It's such a gift. And I yeah. see that in the way that you parent Daisy, <laughs> you know, it's like, you're such a, um, you're such a good mom and watching her, I feel like she's already her own authority and it's just a, uh, what a gift, what a gift for her to grow up that way. Now you became a ballerina. Um, is that what got you to New York ballet? Yeah, I, I danced growing up and then I was in a little conservatory in Chicago. And yeah, eventually that was kind of like, I'm going, I'm going to have to find a way to go. <laughs> so yeah, that brought me to <laughs> New York. I was doing like, I was, you know, trying to do a bunch of different things to figure out what I wanted to do, but TV commercials and things like that. So those, those kind of gigs and a lot of them were dance related gigs started to bring me to New York. And I was like, okay, I can just go there get a roommate and figure this out as I go. <laughs> I love it. Now ballet can be quite, um, there's rules in ballet. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel like that didn't fit for you or, or was there a way that you could reconcile those rules? 
Yeah. So I think I was so, um, I was a big fish in a small pond to start. I was like in my little town, the one in the front and center. And there wasn't, we had ballet and technique and things, but there wasn't sort of the rigid rules. If I was, you know, going to the Joffrey school or school of American ballet theater, it was like small town dance studio. So I thought I was amazing. You know? <laughs> I'm, you know, in the front row at the nursing home, performing for all the elderly people thinking that I'm on stage at Broadway. I had all the confidence in the world because I felt good about it. And also people told me that I was so good at this, but yes. as soon as I, you know, middle school, I got to travel a little bit for these, you know, sort of cheesy competitions and I would, we would win some of them, but then I would get to take classes with the real teachers from New York and LA. And I would see how much I didn't know and how much technique I didn't know. And I just wanted to be dropped off. I said, please don't make me go back to my small town. Let me go here. So I think I, I kind of came at it from a weird beginning and then perspective. So I, I really wanted the, I wanted more structure and more rules. And I just kept going to the classes in, in Chicago and, and, you know, at these little competitions that the New York teachers would come in because I knew if I would get the rules, I could be myself within that because I kind of started in the, you know, they were rules, but looking back, I'm like, they, it wasn't very good. <laughs> 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 you know, a lot of people know these small town dance studios, you know, it's fine, but you, it's different than, you know, performing with, um, you know, Martha Graham and things like that. So I was craving, you know, I really just wanted to be there with the American Ballet Theater teacher and the Martha Graham teacher and just show them what I got, but also respect them enough to learn the technique. And so I loved the technique because I was like, just into it for sure. And you already had so much evidence that you were good. I love mm -hmm. that. You know, it's a belief, we talk about belief being uh, based on evidence. And when you were young, you, you just said, I felt it inside. And then I got the feedback. That's yeah. the evidence, right? Yeah. You're out there dancing and then people are giving you feedback. And the more feedback you get, the more it builds that belief. And so what, by the time you got to New York, you were like, I've got this. Yeah. Was it through ballet that you were introduced to yoga? I, I believe I've read and listened to podcasts where you said that that was the case. Yeah, I got super lucky. So this was in the 90s too. And my my ballet teacher from American Ballet Theater in New York got into yoga, kind of that first wave of 60s and 70s yoga in New York. So he brought a really simple kind of Hatha yoga teacher to our dance program once a week. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I was super into it for myself. I had no idea that it could be a job. I thought the guy teaching us was just, you know, a volunteer because, you know, that's not that's not a real thing. You know? <laughs> so I just knew that this was amazing and I wanted it for myself. And then, you know, I felt that quick feeling of why don't my friends do this? Why doesn't my family do this? And I also felt a little bit, I don't, angry is not the word, but sort of questioning why, why didn't, why didn't I learn this sooner? And why isn't this everywhere? This is a real secret to living a better life and figuring out how to navigate on your path, whatever your path may be. So I just thought this will be something that I keep with me on my journey of life, wherever it takes me. I want to have this kind of centered feeling. When did that change to, this is going to be my life's work? I think I'm still kind of wondering. What that is, you know? <laughs> but, you know, because it was this whack on the back of the head. And when I got to New York, I was dancing and doing music videos. And I remember one night it was like this Whitney Houston music video and the catering girl had a back problem. She was like, oh, it's so hard. And I'm like doing some yoga with her. So I was doing all of these other gigs and jobs. And then I would go to the, this, this, um, you know, it was a Matthew Barney film and it was all the Rockettes and me and another girl that just got to New York, like performing in this film. And on the downtime, everybody would just sit around and get tired because it was sort of these long days. And I would just naturally be like, oh, we should do a little yoga to like boost our energy. So I was sort of always since I, those first classes in the dance conservatory, just finding ways, not just for myself to do it, but to share it. But again, I never thought it was a job. I just, you know, kind of kept going and people kept inviting me at that point to start doing it one-on-one. -on -one. You know, a lot of busy, stressed out New Yorkers would say, oh, can you come over at like 6 a.m.? And I'm like, well, I got something at nine, sure. You know? <laughs> You know, so I just started doing things like that. And a friend who owned a gym asked if I would come in and do a session for their trainers to help them be more mobile. And I was like, well, I've got like an hour between this and this, but I was kind of pushing it away. I'm like, this isn't a real job. Like there's no way that I could pay my bills doing this or, you know, do I even want to do this? But it started to just, I think from 
all of your work kind of thinking about it now that the evidence started to really present like this is bringing together every single part of everything that I know and love. And it's just right in front of me. It keeps landing in my lap. And every time I, you know, talk about it, people want to do it with me. And, you know, I love writing and it was back in the blogging days. So I was blogging in kind of fun ways about yoga, like help I'm addicted to Facebook, five yoga poses that will make you feel better. Or my boyfriend just broke up with me, three yoga poses that make you feel better. <laughs> so no, there you go. Brilliant marketing. I mean, <laughs> it is, you know, I, um, I know that you've done like yoga poses for hangovers. Like that's mm -hmm. brilliant marketing. People want to know that you can help them with their problem. Yeah. And you are very good at being like, this is a problem that yoga can help you with. And I think that following, you know, it is one thing to have this, these breadcrumbs that are sort of leading us to the thing that we're meant to do but following them is not everyone does. And the fact that you did really reflects on you and that idea of like not a lot of rules and being your own authority that I sort of see consistently in your, in your story. Tell the listeners about how Deepak Chopra became part of your journey. Oh my gosh. I mean, another just one of those signs that says, if you don't follow this, you're a total idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I, at that point, I had written enough blogs to start writing for this little magazine out of Rodale that eventually got canceled. I was actually a model for the cover. It's called Yoga Life. And the, the magazine didn't come out that issue. And I called the woman that I knew was the editor there. And I said, hey, I'm at the magazine store. Like, I don't see the cover. And she's like, oh, we canceled the magazine in print. <laughs> but it's, but it's, there's a web version. Would you like to write for it? And I'm like, oh yeah, of course, totally. So I got the gig there. And I thought I would eventually just start working for, you know, women's health magazines and writing about yoga. I'm like, okay, this can be like a job because I love doing this. So I, I convinced once I got there, you know, cause I, I would go to Barnes and Noble or any bookstore and there's no yoga books. It was like the, like the Iyengar book and the, you know, the, the textbooks about yoga, but there was no, nothing else. And it would, they're all by the bathrooms too. Yes. <laughs> like if you have to go to a yoga book, totally. like I find totally, the toilet. Totally there. agree. Barnes and Noble <laughs> by the bathroom. I totally see this section. Yeah. On the low shelf. And there's, there was no <laughs> wellness back then. There was, there was the health cookbooks were like diets and things, you know, it was not how to feel better mostly. So I said, you know, this is a real thing. I feel like every time I talk about this, the blogs, there's readers there. I want to do a yoga book. So eventually they let me do that. And we got, we got going with that. It's like my first like book thing. And I was like, this is amazing. This could be a career now. And they brought me in and they said, okay, who's going to write the cover blurbs? Who are the most famous people, you know? And I'm like, well, I don't know him, but Deepak Chopra would love this <laughs> <laughs> because he's, this is all exactly what he does. And he makes this accessible. And they, and I said, well, you can reach out to him because you're Rodale, you know, you have all the contacts. And they said, no, no, you need to do that. <laughs> So I just went home and I'm like, geez, like I got to meet some famous people. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> like, geez. And literally like in a very short period of time, I got an email to my website at the time inviting me to come and lead a yoga class for like a hundred dollars. Like it wasn't like big events back then, but they wanted to pay me like a hundred dollars to lead a yoga class. And they said, by the way, Deepak Chopra will be there giving a talk. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go. Yeah. So I, I did the gig. And he comes up to me and he says, I really like your YouTube videos. I want to do this yoga app with you. You know, it's very, you know, there was no apps back then. I'm like, what are you talking about? What's an app? You know? Right. So he said, this guy will call you tomorrow. And I said, I was like, this is my chance. And I'm thinking of you right now, because I'm like, I have to say it now or now or never, maybe I'll never see him again. And I said, I have a book coming out whenever it was, will you write a cover blurb for me? And he was like, yeah, of course. And I was like, okay, can you do it right now? Cause like, <laughs> see you and I like write it down on the paper <laughs> and oh he God, totally did and then but we did keep doing things together and we did that app and on the on the shoot of that app he came up to me I remember because he came up to me he was walking from behind and he said will you come over and you know do yoga with me one-on-one -on -one in my apartment and sometimes my wife Rita is there and I just laughed and I said you know you don't need anybody like you know all about yoga you don't need anybody to do yoga with you and then he said to me He's like, yeah, you know, but I, I've taken yoga classes from all of the impressive teachers and they all try to impress me. And then there's no time to do yoga. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, 
I'm just going to, you know, I, I know you, I know your body. I know, you know, you're a busy person. You want to feel good. I can, I can take you through a routine that'll help you. And he's like, that's why I want you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, uh, so. it's your energy. <laughs> it really is. I think that, you know, so much of this is the, you have this open hearted energy. And so these people are just drawn to you and drawn in and, uh, the universe presents things like this. It's amazing. Amazing. Oh, you're so sweet. Which book was that? I'm looking at your book list. That was okay. It's an embarrassing book because it was so like 2009 titling. Oh, I, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wanted to call it yoga for everything. And I didn't know at the time I signed because I didn't have an agent or anything. I signed a contract and they could change the title and it's called Slim Calm Sexy Yoga, which worked at the time. It sold a lot of copies, which I'm very grateful for. But if you open it up, it's like yoga for hangover, yoga for this, yoga for that. So yeah. it yeah, is what I it is. <laughs> I actually, I, I appreciate that because things change mm -hmm. and society changes. Mm -hmm. And so we can look at that title and be like, oh, that's a title of the eighties and nineties, right? Yeah. Like it's a very different thing than what we would do today. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, and I think also it's interesting. And this is something I'm, I, I, I thought I would talk about this later, but it's a good time to talk about it. You have written eight books. You have a ninth in the way. And in looking at, I don't remember what I was looking at, but I might've been the thing you're doing for authors, which I want to talk mm. about in a minute, but you said that you have published them, written them in all different ways. Mm -hmm. The reason that comes up for me is when you have a publisher, they get to decide what the title is. They get to decide a lot of things. What has made you decide to do it in all different ways? You know, a lot of times when someone has published a book with a publisher, mm. they keep publishing a book with the same publisher. And sometimes like I've published my books hybrid. So mm. it's like sort of, I have a publisher, but it's also, I have a lot of control, but the dream for me is still to have a traditional publisher. Cause I mm. haven't done that yet. What has made you sort of change the format and tell me a little bit about that path. Yeah, I think it was always like, what went wrong that I didn't like and, and who can I meet that will, that will do that part. Right. That will also accept me, you know? Yeah. yeah. So from that experience with slim, calm, sexy yoga, I was horrified. Um, but it also did really well. So it kind of afforded me to be able to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I met a, an amazing editor, Heather Jackson, who's an agent now. And she was an editor at random house. And I met her and she was like, you know, I like, let's do something else. And I was like, I want to do yoga for everything. And she was like, no, no, that's just not a good title. To <laughs> so I had coffee with her and I told her the idea and how to kind of expand it a little bit more. And she said, listen, I'm good with titles. You should call it yoga cures. And I was like, that's a little bit too claiming. Like, I also feel weird about it. I'm not a doctor, you know? And she's like, everybody knows you're not a doctor. <laughs> you know, like yeah, no one's saying yeah. you are. <laughs> yeah. So we went with that and that was great. And then that did really well. And I came to them because I was like, okay, great. I'm at Random House. This is like, you go into the building and there's books everywhere and you feel it's like, wow, like this is the place. So I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm a rock star here. So I go in there and that book did well enough to do another one. And I talked to the editor at the time and I said, okay, all these people coming into the studio, they're feeling good from the yoga. They want to know um, about food. I'm not a food expert, but I'm sharing recipes and we're all sharing recipes. And this is about like make your, making your own rules, figuring out what food works for you, kind of getting sensitized from the yoga, then having some, you know, fun recipes. And, and I, you know, I was showing her some recipes that I had in my proposal and she had kind of pigeonholed me as like, and this is even embarrassing because I feel like such a dork, but she was like, well, you're like the sexy one. And, and like mung beans aren't sexy. And I was like, I am so not like sexy to the people who read or like me, but like, that's, they were like, you need to do something else. That's more glamorous. So I, I so I went back and started a Tumblr at the time. And I was like, well, I'm just going to be like, tell these people to follow the Tumblr so I can show the numbers there. And the Tumblr grew and that was great. And, and the, and the editor was still like, well, I don't know. Like, it's just not, it's just not catchy enough. So I, I, I found another publisher that loved it. <laughs> I just kept going there. So it just like, it was eventually like the nose. And I said, well, I know this is a good idea. I, I want to do it. And I just kept kind of trying to find someone that would let me do it. That would also do it in a way that was useful. 
I think that that's beautiful. And it takes a certain inner authority mm. to say like, no, not that way. I'm going to find someone. And and as we get older, I think we tend to get better at that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I see you do. You've done it with yoga. You've done it with the way that you've approached books. You've done it with the way you approach retreats. And then even... Um, I guess this is a good time to talk about it. You're doing something soon. I mean, this, this episode will come out right around the same time. You're doing something for authors or people who want to write books. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, this is, you know, Mike kept telling me because he gets all the info at Strala Yoga emails. He's like, everybody keeps asking you about books and how to write a book. And I'm thinking, okay, like we know Zibby, we know all these book people and they already do that, you know, but I'm thinking the way that it would make sense for me is I'm thinking every time that I've signed books or gone, like had my own book event or something. And, and you probably experienced this too. People come up to you. And the things that I remember most is that, Oh, I was so great on stage or I said all these smart things, but it was those conversations one-on-one -on -one, and they're never about me. It's usually, Oh, there's something in your book that inspired me. And then I would hear their humongous story. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, you know, why am I the only one at this, at my book event with a book? You know, <laughs> like, like you need to write a book and you need to write a book. And, and if you want, yeah. so I kind of just started helping people just on the side, like, oh, you should meet this person or write an outline, or this is how you do it. And just seeing all the, like how confused people can be about the process, how it seems so far away or for, you know, I mean, now with social media, it's, oh, you have to have followers or there's these yeah. things. And, you know, I just, I feel like people, like we want to read books. You read so many books. It inspires me to read more. And it's it's just such a great way to learn something from somebody, whether it's their personal story or something they have to teach. And I feel like we're kind of in this phase right now where we're, we're there's a huge disservice because just getting a book out there is, it seems too hard and it doesn't need to be hard. And there's so many ways to do it. You know, even self-publishing, like if you yeah. self-publish a book and I find out about it and I read it, I'm not going to think it's less than some book at the bathroom at Barnes and Noble. You know what I mean? Like we're all yeah. buying our books online anyway, a lot of the time. So yeah. And people don't know anymore. Like it used mm -hmm. to be less than, you know, it was mm -hmm. like under, you know, people were sort of like, oh, it's self-published. But yeah. these days, there's so many books that are Mel Robbins first book, the five second rule was originally self-published. Cool. Um, and now she's, you know, blown up. So yeah. it's a, I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think that, yes, there are other people that we know who do this kind of work and you do the work with them sometimes, mm -hmm. but everyone's style is different. And mm -hmm. the people that are drawn to you are going to learn this best from you. Mm -hmm. And then the people that are drawn to some of these others are going to learn it best from them or in combination. So I think it's a beautiful thing. We're going to put a link in the show notes to register for it in case that there's still time for people. But um, I think it's something you're going to end up doing more than once. That's I, uh, what Mike said. Yeah, I'm excited. But so many people signed up and I was, you know, it often happens with, with, with this, like, like Michael have an idea about something I should do. And I'm like, I would like to do that. But I don't know if anybody wants to do that with me. And it's usually like the thing that everybody wants to do. So yeah. it'll be fun. <laughs> it's a good partnership when he's able to sort of be like, see things that you are like, I don't know. And then there it goes and it blows up. Yeah. I want to, it actually, that's a great segue because I believe that Mike, for the audience, Mike's your husband, your yeah, partner, <laughs> your, you know, and Daisy's your daughter. I think we've mentioned to her as well. But one of the things that I love about your yoga, um, like love, is the Tai Chi incorporation. Mm. How did that happen? I think I know the answer and I think it has to do with Mike, but mm. how did that happen and why did it happen? Yeah, well, I think I've always felt this yoga connection that is more easeful and graceful and sort of a little bit, you know, and it's not to say, and it took a long time to kind of figure out how to communicate this with people that were yoga teachers because they're like what do you mean you're not holding the pose for 10 seconds and I'm like no yeah. you can hold the pose without freaking out it's like that's all I'm saying <laughs> you know so it was this kind of breath body connection that I knew from dance and I knew from movement and it's just you know life but tai chi explains it very clearly there is no mystery it's about being in your center your breath moving you using only the energy you need resting everything you don't need you know, it's sort of the opposite of how our culture, or whatever, like approaches yoga and really anything. So it's like, we all can get sucked into this, like hold the pose and put in 
the most effort possible, furrow your eyebrow, and then you're doing a good job. It's sort of like suffer through it when you can do the really hard thing. And, you know, to, to use your word, you know, delight in it, not because you're tricking yourself to delight, but allow your breath to move you. And then all of a sudden you're doing this hard thing with so much ease. And so I just started talking, you know, cause Mike and I are together a lot of the time and he never was, he wasn't teaching Tai Chi formally, even though he did that his whole life, but he always thought, you know, Tai Chi is this thing that you only teach if you're in your nineties. You know? <laughs> and that's very, you know, you know, he, he kind of did it in that traditional way. And I thought, well, no one else is teaching this. And if, if Tai Chi becomes popular, you're going to get a bunch of bozos teaching it in a weird way. And it's going to be like, just as weird as yoga has been. Yes, yes. So why don't you start like talking about it more than I can learn more vocabulary for what I already am kind of trying to clue into, but doing that movement kind of anyway. So he started doing more workshops and talking about it. And it really helped me not just explain how to do yoga in a way that feels comfortable and feels like you, but really give a practice for that in a way where it's, I mean, it's such a great thing when you can say, I didn't make this up. Tai Chi says, you know? <laughs> yes. like, yeah, I'm telling you to move from your center, but, but also the, the pose is going to work better. The movement's going to work better. If you include your whole body, not just moving your extremities first, but move your center. And then the rest of you goes along for the ride, you know? Right. So people believe, you know, believe me more when I can say Tai Chi says that, and then look at me, do it. And then look at you do it. And then there's the proof. So, yes, yes. It adds that little bit of credibility when it's mm -hmm. something just like yoga, you know, when people say, oh, it's been around for hundreds of years. Well, so has Tai Chi and yeah. the way that you incorporate the two. So I, I could talk to you all day. I want to be aware of time, but Strala <laughs> yoga is your platform mm -hmm. and it's where the listeners can find all things T Tara, how did you decide, well, what does Strala mean? Mm -hmm. And how did you decide to sort of create this community online there? Well, this was like 2008 when I opened a studio in Mike's apartment because it was like slightly larger than Mike at the time. It was like a nice rent stabilized one bedroom with a big living room. And we needed a name. And I was reading a lot of like, you know, Osho and weird books like that. And I was just thinking about the things that are good from yoga that I was drawn to strength and balance and awareness. And we just kind of mushed up those letters and came up with Strala. And then I was doing a lot of blogs and things. And a Swedish journalist came in to his apartment. We were trying to pretend it was like a real yoga studio <laughs> at the beginning. And she said, it's so cool that you named this Strala. And I'm thinking, well, why? It doesn't really mean anything. And she said, because in Swedish, it means to radiate light to emit rays and to smile broadly. And I'm like, yeah, I totally did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> that was the plan. I love it. That was the plan. So it was totally an accident that ended up being amazing because yeah. it was, that's to me how, and I think to everybody, how you feel when you do a practice that feels comfortable, you radiate that light from the inside. So, so that's how that started. Yeah. And then people just, you know, wanted were coming because they felt good. And then yoga teachers wanted to come because they were taking little elements and saying, Oh, if I, if I do this in my class, more people come and less people get injured. So it just started growing and growing and really becoming, I think because of New York too, and the internet, a global community, everybody would come to New York and do trainings and then go back out to, you know, Europe and Asia and South America and start leading classes. And I just got so lucky because my dream of meeting people around the world completely came true. Now I get to go to these places and have coffee with these Strala teachers and take their yoga class in different languages that I don't understand, but it just follow along with the movement and the breath. And it's, it's been really cool. It's amazing. And it's an amazing <laughs> community. It's uh, the app is beautiful and easy mm -hmm. to navigate. We'll put a link to all of that in the show notes. Um, I know you have another book coming. What's, what's the next thing? Oh my gosh. So this is another um, you know, kind of departure too. And it was another kind of thing where my last publisher was like, yeah, we don't really want that idea for you. <laughs> but I feel like there's something there and it's about softness. And the title we hope is called Living Softly. And it's about putting these practices of Tai Chi and movement and, and moving from your center and using only the energy you need and resting what you don't, but just into normal life. So if I'm successful 
it will be my first book without pictures. That's really my goal. I just want to have a book that's just words. Yes. Yes. <laughs> to not kind of be like, oh, I don't want to pick up that book because I don't want to, you know, it's so much easier to read and to take in than just to take a book and say, oh, now I have to get up and do something. So right. I want to just explain it as a lifestyle and, you know, share experiences on how it's helped my life, but not in a real memoir way, but in a kind of practical way that people can say, oh, I can use that when I'm driving or when I'm cooking or when I'm parenting or when I'm working or just in general, I feel like garbage. How can I feel more like myself? So that's yeah. kind of the goal there. I love it. I love it. And I think it's the right time for it. And it's, it's beautiful. We will all keep our eyes and ears open for that. <laughs> Before I let you go, and I don't even think I gave you the heads up on this. So these are mm. going to be three surprise questions, but I know you can do it. <laughs> the first question, we just recorded one of your podcasts and you've already, I think, answered this question, mm. but what is the last thing you advocated for? Oh my goodness. You know, I would say the snacks and the kids yoga class, but I think it was actually in, in the bringing all the parents together too, in this morning circle and, and, and getting their buy-in to not just watch the kids do yoga, but to have everybody in the room do it at the same time, because I know that that's going to make not just my job go easier, but everybody is going to be so proud of each other because they participate together. So getting everybody off the sidelines and just doing that together. It was like a total success. People were talking about it. <laughs> so good. And they'll go home and talk about it with each other. Shared experiences like that. That's amazing. So good. Such a good thing. What book would you recommend? And you know, I know you read so much and you're so in, in the book world. So it doesn't have to be what book right now comes to mind that you would recommend for the listeners. Oh my gosh. Well, your book, because we're talking about your two books, <laughs> the, the one that's the the list of things to do. I think that's, you know, that's next on my list for sure. Um, you know, this is so corny, but a friend before I met Deepak Chopra gave me his book, seven spiritual laws of success. And I just, we like, we have this house in Illinois and we're kind of like moving here. But the last time we were there, I grabbed a few more books. Cause I'm like, without a lot of my books that I go back to and I grab this one and, and I just picked it up and I'm like, Deepak, you're so good. You know, it's just such an easy thing. Like of all the things you're talking about, like the law of pure potential, like abundance and just how to be centered. So you call good things into your life. And I remember because I've met him, not like as a fan, but just as like somebody doing yoga with him. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, that's the book that everybody loves because it has success in the title, but he says it really could be called, he said he wanted to call it the seven spiritual laws of life, but the publisher liked success because everybody wants to have that sort of material success. And I yeah. thought that was a really interesting feedback too. It's so interesting what sells, you know, yeah. and how, and I think that now I'm going to go down a little rabbit hole, yeah. but I used to sort of revel against that and mm. say, well, like, I don't, it should sell when it says right. what I want it to say, mm -hmm. but the truth of it is you have to meet people where they are. And mm. that's a perfect, or your work is a great example. If you can get people to do yoga because they have a hangover, what do you care? <laughs> They're doing yoga, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so I have to, I have had to be a little less precious about that. Mm. Like even the word advocate, a lot of people don't like that word. And I've been mm. so stubborn about it rather than talking about it in terms of building belief and all the other mm. things that it is. So that's super interesting. I've read that book and I need to reread it. It was a long time ago. So I'm going to pick it back up. Last question is my favorite question. And I can't wait to hear your answer. What is your theme song? If you were walking onto the stage of life, what song would you want playing in the background? <laughs> oh my gosh. I think... I mean, this is so corny too, but like Eye of the Tiger is so good. I mean, I'm such so a good. Gen X. Like, I mean, so I, I loved listening to classic rock going growing up and my dad had a lot of old records and, you know, all that kind of like, just, yeah, that's very motivational. Just, and also it has, it's, it has like a sense of humor, I think for our generation too. Totally. To it. <laughs> totally. I love that song. And I don't think we add it to our Spotify playlist, the Elegant Warrior Spotify playlist. I don't think it's on there. So I'll add it in. Nice. And I am so glad we got to spend this time together. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, you're the best. Thank you.